audience it suddenly got smaller. Uh, do we have any correspondence? Okay, we will move on to the consent agenda. Okay, Madam President, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Well, while we're waiting, um, my name is Diane Elliott, and I was here a month ago talking about some various um, data, and now I get to come back and do a little more and tell you what um, we're working on in the area of social-emotional learning and talk to you about the Social-Emotional Learning Advisory Council. And um, Kim's here, and she'll talk about the mental health intervention team pilot, or excuse me, It's not a pilot anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> confusing each other. So, we can go like that, I guess. That'll work. Okay. That'll work. Is there a clicker? Yeah. It's so special, right? I get to use a clicker. Uh, it won't click unless you're It won't click. click. Oh, oh, I can't get it to go. Oh, shoot. <laughs> it's, it's all right. We'll get it. Emotional Learning Advisory Council was formed a few years ago and um, there was some increases in some data that we were seeing and some of those included an increase in drug alcohol and tobacco discipline referrals, additional needs for foster families and students, an increase in self-harm, suicidal ideation referrals, and so this council was formed to meet monthly, look at data, and determine projects to try to target decreasing some of the risk factors, um, improving prevention education, and um, helping with protective factors. So, um, so why do we have this? Part of the reason is because that it is one of five um, Kansas State Board of Education outcomes, so it's tied to our accreditation. Um, another reason is research shows that social emotional learning and improving those protective factors increases connection to school, which helps people, um, students choose to stay in school and improves their academic outcomes. Um, we also have fewer um, conduct problems and increased pro-social behaviors um, such as kindness, cooperation, um, teamwork, all of those things that you just heard about in some of the um, reports. So another reason is that community members and businesses, when surveyed, they want people who can conflict manage, decision make, um, and those teamwork skills, those are what will propel students fast um, into their career and just as important as finishing their academics. So it also connects to several different board goals. Um, 
improving students' self-awareness, social-emotional awareness, and decision-making, implementing, implementing a comprehensive assessment system. We um, look at social-emotional behaviors and screeners, and um, we also want to implement tiered supports, including AM behavior, so that we respond to individual student needs. There's more of your board goals. <laughs> um, promoting a healthy school and community um, through wellness, uh, assessing indicators of unhealthy student behaviors, and growing partnerships with the community. And so, how does the council do that? We have a lot of different community partners. This is not a complete list, but you can see that it um, runs the gamut from birth to um, beyond. And we also have um, health care representation, um, juvenile detention center, law enforcement, um, as well as a variety of school district representation school nurse. Um, some, some people that maybe um, you don't think of right away, but they um, may see things that we don't always see. So that's the council. What the council does is we review data, we hear reports from community partners, we ask questions, we make suggestions, brainstorm ideas, um, possible projects are identified, um, in my position now, I get to then work with partners, school staff, administrators, district administrators on implementation. Um, it's not just things that our council necessarily comes up with, but it could be a variety of different, um, different works in progress. Some of the council-related activities um, over the past few years Parent University, it's on GardenCitySchools.com under the Parent section. If you go down to Parent University, there are several different um, <coughs> resources to help uh, parents go for information if they want to talk to um, their students about alcohol or vaping or bullying or texting. There are some resources there. There are also lists of counseling um, services in Southwest Kansas and resources in that area as well. The Stop It app, that was um, started a few years ago, but we've just received grant to continue it for another two years. And that, will, that allows for people to, students and parents to report concerning things that they want the school um, staff to be aware of. Partnership with Live Well Finney County, that's one of the things that is a big um, celebration for us. This year, um, <clears throat> they have, in the past, provided training for um, administrators on mental health first aid for principals um, to then watch for concerns among staff but they've also partnered with us so that um, I've been trained in providing mental health first aid for adults who work with youth and I've been able to offer a few courses so far and have plans to offer more so that's for parents for coaches for youth group workers whoever has concerns who ha sees you in their um, personal or professional capacity um, to uh, give them tools to help youth. Another um, thing that we're working on with Live Well Finney County is bringing teen mental health first aid to um, Garden City Chief. So that will be something that helps with um, actually providing teens the ability to listen to each other and give them the know-how when to say, hey, we need to go talk to someone. So um, 
Another couple things that have happened this year, council partners are among those participating, participating in the um, Garden City High School Family Nights um, that the counselors there organized. Genesis, Finney County Attorney's Office, the Sheriff's Office, Livewell Finney County, and ABC Pregnancy are all council partners who participated and presented in the, at those um, family nights. Some projects on the horizon. We are working on a public information campaign related to um, vaping, cyberbullying, suicide prevention, and increasing protective factors for, for um, students and families. I already mentioned teen mental health first day. I'm super excited about that. Another thing that we're starting is SOS, Signs of Suicide, Suicide Prevention Program in the middle schools. And um, so that'll be something that's coming up next year. Some data, um, I know that we talked about the um, Kansas Communities That Care survey results, but there's a lot more data that we have that helps us understand where we are with social emotional learning. Um, and I wanted to just show that there are some ups and downs that we've seen um, over the past few years. Um, alcohol, e-cigarettes, and marijuana, they both, um, they all three, excuse me, had a high in 2018-19 and then dipped back down. So um, that's been really good to see. Our actual tobacco, drug, and alcohol discipline referrals at the high school have decreased from three years ago for a semester um, to this year, mostly in tobacco. So if you look, our tobacco referrals in 2018-19 at the high school, they were 60 in the first semester of 2018-19 and 38 in the first semester this year. Drug referrals, um, stayed about the same and so did alcohol. Our universal screener is how one of the tools that we use to determine if students need small group intervention with a counselor and on that we've had a an increase in the number of students who are in the low risk category. So 85.58 students were in the low risk category in the fall of 21, compared to 83.2 in the fall of 19 and 67.76 in the fall of 2018. That was the first year that we gave that screener, so that could maybe account for part of that huge difference um, in addition to our, it, our implementation of lot of efforts um, so that's that's been a big improvement um, pre-k and K kindergarten students take the ASQ social emotional screener and those are rated by a parent or guardian and we've also in seen an increase in no concerns of 5% in the past few years self-harm referrals have also decreased in the past few years we had 205 2018-19 and now 37 through January of 22. So I went over that really fast, <laughs> but um, do you have any questions? I have a question. So your trends seem to be kind of going in the right direction from the data that you presented us this evening. Uh, what are some factors that I think there are several things, but um, there's been a lot of efforts with prevention education, and um, there may be some more detail in that area from some of the others here, but another factor is that we did implement our Tier 1 curriculum in... Um, last year. Was it last year? Last year's our first year. First year, okay. So last year was our first year for that, and the Stop It app, we also pushed out, um, and I think that had some impact.
impact as far as um, you know giving it an opportunity for people to report if they felt like they needed to um, do you have I would also say I think what Kim's going to talk about here in a minute with our Michael student program I think that's probably had a significant impact too on just having the availability for our kiddos to have access to, to that mental health support um, I think that's had a big impact on, on when we look at the self-harm data that we've seen in the, the major decrease we've seen there. I think having that access in the building, we've not been as lucky this year because Compass is dealing with the same struggles that we are as far as hiring certified staff. And so the therapist that we did have that was working um, in the buildings actually loved Compass and we sold her and she's a guard counselor for us in Garfield now, um, which was good for us, but not good for us at the same time. Um, so I do think that, that that's had a, a pretty good impact on that. Another thing I'll add is that the um, high school and KH and now Garden City Achieve have a resist chapter, which is um, geared toward um, anti-tobacco messaging, um, education about vaping, um, kind of putting the message out there about the safety concerns, um, the health concerns, all of that education that, um, you know, kids may not think about right away, but it's peer-led, and so it really helps that um, be a cool thing to quit <laughs> because it's run by students. There, um, the reduction isn't as great. Um, I need to look at the data again, but there, it, it's a little bit higher than we would like for the other grades. But I would also say that their numbers weren't as high right. to start with either, so you're yeah. not going to see as big of a, you know what I mean? same time as the uh, other screeners that we have and it is the social social academic emotional and behavior um, screener and what the students do if they are in second grade through 12 is that they rate themselves on several questions if they are in kindergarten and first the teachers only rate them and then second through 12, the teachers also rate the students in those same areas that the students rate themselves. So each um, domain, the social domain, the academic domain, and the um, emotional domain, they have target scores and they have different questions. So like in the social domain, um, they might ask about um, how they get along with peers. In the academic domain, they might talk about how they feel about, um, do they feel prepared for school? Um, do they get nervous about tests? You know, just different things like that. Um, in the emotional domain, it'll be about anxiety or um, things that, yeah, things that um, self, uh, yeah, self-regulation, I thought, was thinking of something else, but I lost it. But yeah, so there's different domains, and then there's a whole target score. And the target score is what we look at, among other things, to determine whether um, a student needs more support. So when you gather the data from the teacher and from the student, are those pretty well correlated, or sometimes you see some? Sometimes not, sometimes they are. Um, and sometimes those things can give us a oh man, we need to check on this kiddo um, because they're saying that they feel um, 
like they need more support. And we can notice that because of how they rate it themselves. Um, there are some students that, um, you know, don't show how they're feeling sometimes. And so um, when we see those big differences, we can, that helps us know that there might be something to look into. Conversely, um, there are sometimes times when a student rates themselves a lot higher than a teacher and um, you know we can look at that as well. So you can compliment your self-esteem. <laughs> self yeah. yeah. I think a lot of the things where that helps is the kiddos that are really quiet and don't say a whole lot. You know those are the kids that you just tend to think are there's no problems with or maybe even dealing with anxiety or depression and you don't notice that because they're just quiet and they're in the younger grades like second grade is the first time that they rate themselves and so that is where the biggest difference is between the teacher and the um, student rating but it's the first time they're taking that they're still developing awareness of the vocabulary uh, the concepts um, what that looks like so um, in the earlier grades you know it may be a conversation with the student that the counselor has Several of our counselors have, have talked about how they, when they notice those differences, they'll, they'll talk to that little third grader or second grader and you know try to figure <coughs> out if there's something more there. But um, yeah, second grade, like I said, is the, is the biggest difference. Yep. So I wanted to kind of piggyback on that because that was my question is, um, so, and I'm not sure how the test is administered because if they do they have conversations do they go through the questions because even the concept of like self-regulation I just wonder at what age are kids really understanding what that means because it can you know there's lots of different maybe things to self-regulate and so I, I just wonder and the other thing I was thinking about too was are kids okay is this administered in a way that because there's still like some stigma attached with mental health or those types of things so I just wonder Well, in the earlier grades, when they take those screeners, what I've seen is that um, they will put on their headphones because a lot of the parts are read to them. And um, they're all doing it at the same time. It's a common practice, a common procedure. So it's something that they're used to. Um, and up through the upper grades too. I mean, it's, it's A routine basically and so um, and the way that they sit usually there's not people looking over each other so yeah. it seems yeah. and I would say when they're done they're not going to have access to their scores nobody's going to be able to see their they're not gonna right know. And, and nobody around them is going to know whether they scored high risk or, or some risk or, or low risk um, that's something that I, I think yes. so. I mean, from, from my perspective, with the older kids, most of the time, not all of the time, but I would say most of the time, those scores are usually within just a few points of where the teacher would rate them at. Uh, oftentimes, I mean, we do have a few little anomalies, but most of the time, I, I think they, I think they make it. The serious is they do make it in those assessments, you know. So. And I think um, as they take it over time. There's more awareness of what those things mean, and um, they have different, like they have a health class, they have different counseling lessons, they have certain things that help them um, develop that awareness. Okay. You guys are in for a treat because technology and I don't usually get along, so we're. <laughs>
we're going to just hope I don't screw this the whole up now. Good evening, I'm Kim Fisher. I'm the Behavioral Health Liaison for the district. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about mental health intervention teams. Um, USD 457 has had mental health intervention teams for four years. This is our fourth year with this project. And 457 was one of the first district teams in the district in the state to start one of these kind of projects. Um, and in our, oh, see, sometimes I ramble. Um, it is funded through the state legislature and supported by KSD. And for this school year, we're serving 12 buildings in the district. So seven elementaries, both intermediates, both middle schools, and an alternative education center. Um, in our district, we've called this program the Mindful Student Support Program. So you might hear some interchanging of that language. Apparently, we like to call things really large acronyms. So we just kind of gave it a big name for you to remember. Um, and it is a partnership between Compass Behavioral Health, our local community mental health center, district and the goals the overarching goals of the project are to reduce barriers to mental health treatment for students and a special focus given to the students in foster care as you know oftentimes they're moving a lot so that prevents some different unique challenges for them and I put the board goals there that um, the mindful student support program addresses for you similar to Diane's 1.5 and 3.4 We are excited that the legislature has approved funding again for next school year, so we will be able to continue the program. And as Mrs. Guyon alluded to earlier, unfortunately, currently, we do not have a therapist serving kids in schools through this program because she left family time with Dr. Garfield, and Compass has had a very challenging time getting a therapist right now. And that doesn't mean that the kiddos aren't getting therapy. It just means that they're not getting therapy in the school. The parents have to take them to, to the office to get so they're still able to have access and they still get attendant care and they still get case management and all those things in the school. They just don't have a therapist that's able to come to the building because they don't have the resources to make that happen right now. So to give you just a little bit of information on how students would come to be in the Mindful Student Support Program, we have a QR code that links to a Google form and all of the um, principals and counselors in the buildings we serve have access to that. And they then just fill out a very simple short what the concerns are for the student after they've gotten permission for the program we've already received that Ms. Brock said they received parent or guardian permission before referring and upon completing that referral it comes to me and then I contact the parent or guardian to give them just a little more information um, answer any questions they might have about the program and help schedule an intake for them with the compass therapist traditionally that intake could be done at school or at compass again since we're missing that After that intake, they'll be offered services based on their needs and medical necessity. So that could be individual therapy, and as Mr. Bradman said, traditionally that would be at school during their school day, which helps reduce that transportation barrier for a lot of students. Um, it could be community-based services, which are things like case management, intensive care, and therapy, or it could be medication evaluation and management. Um, again, those are all based on just that individual student's need and the medical necessity. And parents and guardians have the contact day of continuing with those services at any time. And we monitor progress for those students involved through two reports, one at the end of the first semester and one at the end of the year. And a little information. Oh, sorry, that's really small. Um, this is last school year's end of the year report. So you can see we served 187 students last school year in this program. And we look at four main data points, attendance, academics, internalized and behavior, and externalized and behavior, that we want to see improvement in for the students. So you can see some of those percentage totals for last year on one side. The attendance for students involved improved by 47%. 47% of the students involved improved their attendance. Academics, 64% had improvement. Externalizing behavior, <coughs> internalizing about 30%. So externalizing behaviors would be like OSS, ISS, referrals to principal, um, insubordination, sort of um, 
verbally acting out to establish their sense of self. Internalizing behaviors would be more along the lines of um, suicidal ideation or um, repeated vigil visits to the counselor's office for anxiety or depression or panic, which would internalize these behaviors. So we collect all that data from Skyward. last year is still participating, participating this year, but it wasn't a new referral pool for you to be counted in that. So this is just a little snapshot of data from our fall semester of this year. Um, we're at 172 students served. Attendance improved for 86 of those students. Academics improved for 97 of those students. And then for external behavior improvement, we had behavior was marked as a problem. Of those 128, 104 so far have shown improvement in that first semester. And similarly, 9 of 16 for internal. Served 25 foster students last year, 22 so far this year. And Mr. Gunnan had asked me to get some crisis information from Compass, which came to me late and I didn't get it on a slide, but um, calendar year for 2021, Compass saw 800 crisis appointments total, 18, I'm sorry, 17 or younger, 426 really, 429. And for kind of the time frame of our fall semester, 200 of those 426 were 17 or younger crisis appointments. So it gives you an idea about how they're seeing kids come into their system. So I think we're trending to look pretty similar number-wise on our end of, of data that we're reporting from last year to this year. We see recurring referral themes of, let's say, anger management, um, emotion regulation kind of themes, anxiety and depression, um, peer or family relationships that just aren't going well, and um, decent amount of impulsivity that affects kind of classroom management or, or academic challenging time of not as many therapists right now. Um, truly, case managers are the ones that are seeing the kids more frequently than the therapist, and they're usually getting the therapy once a month, if that right now. Case managers are seeing kids weekly, not more than once a week. I think so, you're right. Yeah, so I think that's, the kids that hit those services really see a lot of support, and I would have to think that that's a very helpful indication. You say they do see a lot of support, 
Yes. That's what you're supposed to do. A compass really doesn't share much with us, right? Because that's a different entity. In terms there. of data? Or yeah, as far as data or individual case, um, details, it, that kind it, of thing. Individual case depends on if we have a signed release. So if parents will sign a release, you know, they can check what they want shared and what they don't. Um, so typically, we're able to get um, a treatment plan, which will help us know what kind of goals we're working on, a purpose, a diagnosis, what the kids are doing. Oh, okay. So as long as parents sign a release, release yes. And, and we do that a lot, Mark, when we, when we have uh, like IEP meetings with the kiddos, get the compass services, we'll, we'll have information. And, and sometimes compass will even come to those meetings with us. Because I, I mean, obviously that's the value, particularly if they're not coming into the school, that that's the value of that relationship, right. that shared information. Yes. It's sort of the team approach to helping the student get what they need. Exactly. Yep. And, and so I just got to two requests today that I helped connect those two. So yeah, that's a part of my job as well. And as long as that release is there. And I would say too, for our kiddos that are really struggling, you know, um, we can initiate a TEP referral for the kiddos to go to the therapeutic school. And Compass can initiate that referral, the parents can initiate that referral, or the school. So any, as long as the kiddo, the only requirement that we have is they have to be in Compass services. And so as long as they're in services with Compass, then there's a there's a, an application, I guess you would call it, that you fill out and, and it comes to us. And then um, we there's a committee that looks at that and we determine whether that kiddo would be a good candidate for the therapeutic school. Follow-up question then to your comments. Um, is there any, I mean, there's a, long as they have the services from Compass. So we're not seeing so far with the shortages of therapists and that kind of thing, that there's an impediment there in qualifying. Correct. Yeah, because oh, they can still. Services? Right. Yeah. No, no. We, mm -hmm. no we're just, taking referrals, we're doing exercises. The, the, <laughs> I would say like at the TP, the one thing that we, that we do struggle with is when we had a therapist on staff and was in the building, she was able to go and do their therapy sessions right there when they were at the TP. And they don't have that now. They have for that, but they still have, we still have staff, um, Compass staff that, that's in the building every day, they're in the classrooms. Um, our kiddos, when they go to that program, they go in there for, um, they get two hours a day of mental health support. Um, most of that's not obviously with a the therapist, that's with the case manager and, and things like that, but there are folks that, that work with them on, on those events. One more question, sir. <laughs> Like so many other areas with the challenges of finding personnel, um, sometimes the work goes then to the, I hate to say it, but sort of less qualified or less experienced um, community members or staff. Or, or, and and I, I don't know what the, maybe I need to go to HR. Hey, I did my part. We stole the person. From. Yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I heard that. You know, it's, I guess, you know, we as a community and as a school district, we want to, we're just going to do as best as we can yeah. and set the goals high and et cetera. But there's I, a reality there, and I'm just sure you, I mean, you've got great numbers in, in this presentation, and it's very encouraging. And so, kudos. Um, I, I will say um, that uh, Kim just presented at the, she presented to the Compass Board, was it last Thursday? Mm -hmm. I, well, I guess. Not last Thursday, the Thursday before, but she presented to them, and and one of the discussions they had talked about was was the same thing. You know, they were I'm sure this, this the conversations that we had before board meetings about how they're short staffed and what they're doing to recruit, and that's when they're doing a lot of the same things that we're doing as far as they've got kids that are on scholarship um, that are going to enter in to be therapists, but they're still a couple years out. So we've got we've got a lot of a lot of kids in the pipeline. It's just they haven't made it to Compass yet because they're not done with school. So in a few years we'll be in. in the bucket but it's in the right direction so well and, and I will say too that um, in our conversations with Compass Glenn and I have talked a lot about how we want we want we're in 12 buildings that's great but we have 18 buildings that we need support and we want to give them out more and Compass is Compass is willing to do that they've just got to get the people and, and they've already said that that they've got the slot and it's it's there once they get the therapist hired for for us to expand into the other buildings we just got to they've got to get the personnel in place to make that happen they're dealing with a lot of the same issues that we're dealing with, so. Other questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.